Hi, I'm Bill Carmody, and I'm the Marketing Whisperer, and today you will not believe who I have on the program, none other than the amazing, best-selling author, Tony Robbins. Hey, Tony. How you doing? So Tony is here to talk today about Unshakable, his new book, which comes out after Money Master the Game, which is a number one New York Times bestselling book. And uh, now I want to ask him, so Tony, you already had this amazing financial book. Why the second book? Well, that's a good question, because, you know, uh, I wrote 670 pages <laughs> in Money Master the Game, and I think you know I don't like writing. But I was so obsessed, because after 2008, seeing everybody lose, you know, their homes and losing half of their net worth, and seeing nothing be done about it, about two years later, I finally said, look, I've got this relationship with people like Paul Tudor Jones that I've coached for 24 years. He hasn't lost money in 24 years. Amazing. I've got access. What if I interviewed the 50 smartest people in the world, the Warren Buffetts, the Carl Icons, right? You know, the Ray Dalios. And so I did, and I'm thrilled with that book. It's the number one bestseller, not because of me, but because all these incredibly genius people, it's all their content that I delivered here. Uh, and we fed 100 million people. I fed 50 million through the book, and then I matched it for another 50 million, and we did it again last year. So I thought, with all the fear that's gone on the last two years, and you're seeing things in the marketplace you've yes. never seen in history, negative interest rates. You know, the Wall Street Journal hired a historian to say, when was the last time we've had negative interest rates? And the answer was never in the 5,000 <laughs> years of banking history. In 5,000 years, you always gave them money, they paid you for your money, and then they loaned it to somebody else to make money. It's the first time in history you pay them to give them your money. It's insane. You know, Toyota has a bond out right now, Bill, that's .0006. It'll take 69,000 years for you to double your money if you invest <laughs> in that bond. You know, people are buying 50-year Italian bonds for 2.4%, and it's oversubscribed. You know, a government that doesn't last very long, that's not yeah. very stable. So we're living in crazy times, and where it really hit me, Bill, and why I decided to write this book was about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and I was sitting down with my platinum partners, and I'd bring them together each year, and we'd bring like six or seven multi-billionaires that started with nothing, and some of the best investment geniuses in the world. We spent a week going like, how do you protect yourself, and how do you grow? And so I thought, who better to bring at this crazy time to get answers than the former Fed chair, right? It's like, if you <laughs> if you wanna like know who, what's going on, go to Alan Greenspan. I mean, he was I Fed it. chair for 19 years, four presidents, right? You know, some were eight year presidents. He's around for a long time. So I spent two and a half hours offline talking to him and about two hours with him on stage. And we talked about everything you can imagine, the craziness of the markets and where we are today. And then my final question to him was, look, if you were made back the head of the Fed today, what's the first thing you would do? And he paused and he looked at me, he paused, paused again. Everybody's like, wait a bit of breath. And he leaned in and he said, resign. <laughs> so, so I like, if, when he says resign, when, when he doesn't know where the hell it's going, you know, Howard Marks said to me, he's head of Oak Tree Capital, they manage $100 billion. And in 2008, when everything was melting down, they were investing almost a billion dollars a week in stocks because he felt they were just too cheap. He's a brilliant guy. He said to me, Tony, if you're not confused by what's going on, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, so, so, here, so here's what's saying. So I, I loved Money Master the Game. It was I, I loved yes. the book. I think it was fantastic because the one before that I wrote, uh, wrote, read The Intelligent Investor. And it's like yes. an economics book written by an economics professor for economics professors. And it's like so, you know, even though Warren Buffett made all his fortunes off that book, it's really dry. Money Master the Game was easy to read, really wonderful. And this one yes. goes even further. And I think the brilliance of this book is the simplicity simplicity of which you boil it down. You took, I thought the 620 pages was a great boil down version, but you went yeah. even further and went to less than 200 pages. You bring yeah. all the insights of the 50 top most brilliant financial minds in the world into this book. And I think it's just amazing. So oh, I really appreciate it. So let's ask you this. So how do you retire rich? Right. This is the question. You know, <laughs> I'm, we're writing this for for Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine. Yes. We're going to have this book published up there. And the number one thing that entrepreneurs want to know is how do I retire rich? So okay. the question is, you talk about the core four. Let's go into the core four, because those four simplistic ideas are the most important things to help pe people build their wealth and make sure that they maintain it. There are so many things that can mess up your business, even when you're brilliant. I mean, the government can change a rule instantaneously your airbnb or you know your your uh you know uh, car sharing experience you know one of our car sharing companies i'm blanking out besides lyft what am i thinking right. of uber uber and they change the rules and you're out of business in that country or that city or that state just one example or new competition or new technology 
all these things can disrupt. So I teach people how to take advantage of all those opportunities, but you gotta have a business, and the way you get that business is really simple. No matter how much you're pouring into your business, mm -hmm. someone taught me this years ago, Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager. Yep. Years ago, I helped him take five strokes off his golf game. I don't play golf, and he thought I was God, so, <laughs> so I gotta give back to you now. I said, well, how do you wanna give back? He said, you're about to you know, put out your first book, it was Unlimited Powers, 24, and he said, I'm gonna give you the best financial advice that was given to me, and he said, a business will always spend whatever capital is available. Because yes. when you're growing your business, the demand is always there. And he said, so what you have to do is take some money off the table that the business never sees. And he said, this guy told me before I wrote One Minute Manager, the, the business will get the benefit of that book, like all the customers, but all the income should go into a separate account that you never touch and it just gets invested. You don't spend it. And he convinced me to do that with both my book and then I decided to do it with my first infomercials. Yeah. And that's what made me wealthy because now I've made tons of money in businesses and so forth, but during the tough times when it looked like near bankruptcy, I yep. didn't go bankrupt, but it was scary times, cash flow challenges, challenges in the economy, everything else, I still had capital that kept me sane, and I was able to support the business and support myself simultaneously. Now, well, and, what, and you how do you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you call that the wealth tax, right? You, you tax right. yourself so that you can retire and be wealthy, right? Without a doubt, and you know, the best example that I actually wrote about in Money Master the Game, which yeah. was Theodore Johnson, just so people know, most people think I'm gonna get rich by growing my business and I totally support that. I mean, we're running a new uh, contest called Build a Bigger Business. Uh, if the people go to uh, www.shopify forward slash Tony, we've got a new contest, costs nothing to join and I send you all my material to train you and if you have a nice. $1 million to $50 million business, we'll help you to grow. But the wealth tax is this guy works for UPS, Theodore Johnson. He never earned more than 14,000 in a year. That's the most he ever earned. And he retired with $70 million, Insane. gave away 35 million was alive. And how he did it was a friend of his said, I wanna make you rich. We're gonna put a tax on you, a 20% tax. He goes, I can't spend 5% of my money. I need every penny. He goes, you're a little just. If the government came along and said, there's a 20% additional tax, you'd scream, you'd yell and you'd pay it. And right. you'd adjust. Right. So he got him to do that, and that compounded is what put him to seventy million dollars, never making fourteen grand. So you want to be in business, but in order to do that, you know the old phrase that when a person with experience meets the person with money, <laughs> the person with the experience ends up with the money, and you end up with experience. Right? That's right. So this book is designed to change that. Now let's talk about the core four. Core four. The yep. first step, if you haven't done it, which I assume most people have, is you've got to decide that you're going to become an owner and an investor, not just a consumer. Mm -hmm. You've got to take a percentage of what you earn and set it aside. And that's hard for business owners because they're pouring everything into the business. But you and I both know the biggest mistake in finance, as everybody knows, is you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And yet most of us do that with our business. So I, my number one reason of joining you right now is I want to get them to set up another account if they haven't already. Yep. I want them to automate that account. And then these books will show you how to create the asset allocation you That's want. Right. Or, or, or you can go to, you know, uh, my co-author of this book, by the way, is Peter Malouk. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't never co-authored before, but he's my partner in business. He owns Creative Planning. Mm -hmm. I'm on his board. I'm, I'm the head of, of investor psychology for the firm, and I'm his partner in businesses. So his business has grown from the $500 million business in 2008 within two years with absolutely no advertising, mm -hmm. he took that business to 2 billion, now it's 23 billion. You know, partners. And the reason he grew it is because he warned people what was gonna happen during the crash. He didn't know when it was gonna happen, he said, here, it's gonna happen, and when it happens, this is what we're gonna do so you don't lose 50% or 20%, and here's what we're gonna do to take advantage of it. So I want people to know there's a plan in here for that. But one of the things I did when I interviewed all these people, as I said, coming to your core four is, yeah. I'm interviewing like Sir John Templeton, who made all this money when blood was in the streets. Right. Right? He waits till the worst time, and he believes maximum pessimism. Uh, you know, you interview somebody like uh, you know my friend Paul Tudor Jones. I've been coaching for 24 years. Paul's a macro trader. Yep. You go over to Carl Icahn. He's an activist investor. They all do it totally differently. So what I found those are four things that they all obsess about, even though they're different. And if you do these four, they're like the mini checklist for deciding what you're gonna invest in. And how to invest in those things are different, but what to invest in. Right. And the four are really simple. Number one, you have to, these guys are not obsessed about making money, which you would think they are. They're obsessed about not losing money. Right. And the average investor is, how do I make money? They know that if a market drops, a crash drops 50%, you, you don't have to make 50% to get even, you gotta make 100%. 100%. Yeah. You understand, Bill, if you got 100 grand and you lose 50%, you're down to 50, 
and you say, okay, I'm going to grow at 50. That's only 75,000. You have to grow 100 to get even. It might take you a decade. So the way they do that is by creating an asset allocation, dividing up their assets in a way so that when markets drop, they never get hit. So that's number one. Number two, the one that's more sexy is called asymmetrical risk reward. Yeah. Every single one of them are obsessed with it. And all that is, is most people think that if I'm going to be an investor and I'm going to make any money, I have to take these huge risks because in order to get huge rewards. And it's quite counterintuitive. Well, and, and I'll stop for right there for a second, because that's also what they're being, that you're being taught, right? For the people that are the brokers, not fiduciaries, and we'll talk about that later, the people yes. that are selling you the assets are like, well, you can't go out there and just expect to make a huge return without investing something. You got to risk it all to make something. And so we've been trained incorrectly that you have to risk it all to make anything, even 10%. So you risk a dollar to make 10 cents. You're saying do the opposite. Do, risk correct. 10 cents to make a dollar. And, and that's what the greatest investors do. And it's not easy for them to do by any sure. stretch. It's hard to find those opportunities, but they focus on it. So for example, Paul Tudor Jones, who I've coached for 24 years, hasn't lost money in 24 years. Paul's whole approach is five to one. Yeah. If I'm gonna invest a dollar, I'm gonna risk a dollar, try to make five. That's a good risk, yep. right? Now, if I'm wrong, I, I can risk another dollar and still make five, and guess what? I'm still up. Yep. He can be wrong four times out of five, and he still, you know, he breaks even. Right. Uh, Kyle Bass is the gentleman who took $30 million, sounds like a lot, but he turned into $2 billion in two years, and, and he did it in 2008, 2009, worst time in history, but the reason he did it is he never risked more than six cents to make a dollar. So he could have been wrong 15 times, Bill, and still made money. It's amazing. So, or a, a really good example is, uh, I just saw a picture of him a little bit ago, there's a TV screen somewhere in my, my back of my eye, I saw it somewhere, was President Obama today was out there with my friend Richard Branson. He's doing kite, kite flying, kite sailing. But Richard is a perfect example. He risks his life all the damn time. He takes enormous risks on boats. On you know, about a month ago, he crashed on one of his bikes, you know, and almost <laughs> smashed his head in. He's always doing something crazy. But he he doesn't take risks in business or investing. His risks there are minimum. His number one question in investing and in business is. How do we protect the downside? That's so right. when he went to go do um, the, the purchase of, when he went to open up Virgin Airlines, he's competing with some of the biggest firms in the world. And his brain is like, how, I got a lot of risk here. I'm buying these Boeing business jets. This could literally put me under. Right. So he negotiated for a year before he convinced them to let him work for two years. And if he went under, he could give back the jets and pay nothing. And he pulled it off. And of course, he didn't go into business. So we had no downside, all upside. That's Amazing. the asymmetrical reward. And then third one is, you don't want to start with this, but you've got to understand tax efficiency. Yes. If you try to make investments based on tax efficiency first, you're making a big mistake. At yeah. first, it's not lose money. It's asymmetrical risk reward. But if you got those two, you can only spend what you keep. Right. And when you look at your mutual funds return, all these returns, it's all gross returns. You got to look at fees and taxes to know where you really stand. And so you got to make sure you're tax efficient. And then the fourth one is obvious. It's diversification. It's yes. only free lunch. Yes. So um, the gentleman, uh, David Swenson, who's the head of Yale, CIO, chief investment officer of Yale, took them 200 years to accumulate a billion dollars for Yale. He turned into a billion and a 25 billion in two decades. It's unheard of. He's the greatest institutional investor of all time. Yeah. He said to me, Tony, it's diversify, diversify, diversify it diversify across assets. What most people do is they grew up and their family flipped houses, so they love real estate and flip houses until they get crushed. Right. Or their family loves stocks, so they love gold. And what Ray Dalio told me was, no matter what you like, if you don't diversify radically across the board, there's gonna be a day when your favorite asset class, your real estate, your insurance, your your gold, your you know stocks, whatever it is, your bonds are gonna drop by 50% to 70%. If it happens later in life, it's too late. So you diversify, Amongst assets, amongst asset classes, amongst countries, and across time. Yes. Those four, everybody has in common. And I use those in my checklist when someone's coming to talk to me about investments. Tell me how we're not going to lose money. It's not the question you usually hear. Right? How are we going to diversify? What's going to be the SLK? Okay, show me what the asymmetrical risk reward is. Show right. me where, how are we going to do this tax efficiency? And then what are, how are we diversifying that? When those four are there, it gives you this checklist that's second to none in my experience. So uh, it's brilliant. Those core four is basically how people, when, when implemented successfully, along with paying the wealth tax, you that's take you, you, you tax yourself first, take that 20% off the table, and then use or those four, core or four. Or 15, wherever they can start. That's right, exactly. And, and I also love your idea of the future cash. If you can't take 20%, start with 5% and promise every time you get a bonus, every time you get a raise, ratchet it up until you get to 20% because everybody can 
can do this. They just, the, the problem is if you don't get that discipline early on, you spend what you make, just like a business, right? So you correct, need to be correct. able to get in that position. So now- and What here, I tell people, people that are in business, by the way, who are watching right now, who maybe the business is not yet profitable or it's just barely profitable, they're saying, Tony, I can't put this money aside. What I say to them is you gotta put this tax on yourself because yes. you will adjust. Uh, you know, I went through a divorce years ago. It was a really brutal divorce. Uh, you know, the woman I was with is a good human being. We're good friends right now. Good. But she got an eight times multiple on my businesses when my businesses were not billion dollar companies. They were like hundred million dollar companies and they all depended upon me. Right. So I didn't have eight times that I had to pay this woman. It was crazy. And I, and I had to pay her a million dollars a year before I opened my eyes, before I fed my family or anybody else, right? And when I met her, she was broke. So it was kind of disconcerting. Yeah. And I used to be frustrated and angry. One day I just said, take it off the top, automate it, don't ever let me see it, and it's I done. will find the way to do it. That's and right. after I did that, after three or four months, I forgot about it, and you know, 17 years later, it was paid off last year. And I looked around and said, my God, I didn't even think about it very much during that time. And I made more, more than enough money. Your brain will adjust, but you gotta do this. And I, like you said, start with five or 10 or 15 and build up to it, you'll get to where you really want to be financial. So now, so now one of the questions that I was really interested in in Money Master the Game and then it was revisited again in Unshakable was the fiduciary standard, right? And the thing that's really important for me here is, is that I was so relieved in the first book that I went and I talked to my, my, my uh, uh, guy at Merrill Lynch and I'm like, okay, he's actually a registered uh, fiduciary. Okay, fantastic, check the box. And in this book, he said, but wait a minute, he's also a broker, isn't he? And I'm like, I no! <laughs> oh, I know. Let, let's clarify. Let's clarify because, you know, very sophisticated business owners yes. get screwed yes. by more sophisticated investment people. Yes. <laughs> and let's talk about who the investment people are for a second. So yeah. there's 310,000 people in the investment community, financial advisors, wealth advisors. But there, I think there's 225 different terms for a broker. Yes. That's what it is. And there's nothing wrong with a broker. A lot of brokers are high integrity people that really give a damn but they work for the house yes. and the house always wins. See, these companies, these financial companies are not bad. They're just corporations whose job it is, is to maximize shareholder returns. That's right. So how do you do that? By charging you more and more fees and ideally not having you notice it so you don't object. And so the entire system is wired that way. So of the 310,000 people are out there, 90% are brokers, only 31,000, 10% of them are fiduciaries. Now what's a fiduciary? It's a big word. The, av the broker just has to provide investments he calls suitable. Suitable means like, you know, it's a suitable meal. It's a suitable conversation. It's okay. It's okay, right? And what it is is okay is he thinks it aligns with your goals. There's no way to enforce this. Right. But if you choose to be a fiduciary, that means you say, I don't take commissions. I'm not making money off of you. I am going to be paid for my advice to you. And my advice will be transparent because there's no secondary gain. That's right. I'm not going to lend you go to this fund over here because I get a 3% commission. Right. I'm just going to recommend what's best for you. And so that person is legally required to give you their best advice. So if they tell you to buy Apple this morning and they buy it after you this afternoon and they get a better price, they have to give you their stock. That's how strong the laws are. Yes. But it's this tiny group of people. So I wrote about it in the book. I donated 100% of the profits of the book because I told you fed 100 million people. And then I built a platform with some technology people because the biggest problem is finding out what people are charging you because yes. the challenge in this stuff is that you know most people think they don't know what they're being charged. And if they do, they'll tell me 1%. That's right. what their broker will tell them. Well, 1% is only one of 17 fees. <laughs> the average mutual fund has 3.12% in fees, which still sounds small. It's only 3%. No, it's but a lot. The difference between one and three percent, watch this. You got a hundred thousand dollars, you're thirty-five, your buddy has a hundred thousand dollars, you both put it in the market, you both invest in the same equities, the same stocks, through a mutual fund, but two different mutual funds. One charges three percent, one charges one percent. Well, at thirty years later at sixty five, if you didn't add a dime, your hundred thousand dollars, if you were charged one percent, were seven hundred and sixty two thousand bucks. Wow, hundred grand goes to seven hundred and sixty two, nice. didn't add a dime. Pretty damn good. Yep. But if you had the same stocks, but you pay 3% in fees, you got $452,000. You got what, you know, 40, 50% less money, and also it's gonna run out quicker. The guy that you know will manage to charge 1% in fees got a 762, he's taking out like 60 grand a year towards paying for things. He's got money till he's 92, the other guy's got money till he's 78. So, I mean, you're gonna run out of money, and then what are you gonna do? So it's so critical to manage the fees. And the fiduciary side, here's the kicker. So yeah. I, I write Money Master the Game, proud as hell of it. It goes to the number one. People's lives are being changed. Everything I hope we feed 100 million people. 
I'm feeling really happy and satisfied. And then Peter Malouk, my now partner from, um, from Creative Planning, calls me up and says, Tony, I want to meet with you. There's You care so much about people and the fiduciary standard is such a big piece for you. There's a gray area in the law that's being abused and I really think you need to know about it. And I don't think any, clearly no one has told you and no one's telling anybody else about it. So yeah. he flew out to LA, met with me. And he proceeds to tell me that a fiduciary, I'm saying to you, I'm telling you the best advice. I'm not getting anything out of it except my fee. And the fee yeah. is usually 1% or less or a flat yeah. fee, whatever it is. Well, these fiduciaries of the 32,000 fiduciaries out there, registered investment advisors, out of all of them, that 10% of people at the bottom, only 1.5% are not duly registered. Now, what does duly registered mean? It means that they're registered fiduciary, and they'll tell you I'm a fiduciary, but what they don't tell you is I'm also a broker. So in the middle of the conversation where I'm telling you information that's only your benefit and you're feeling safe, I turn my hat over and now I sell you something that I'm making, it not because it's best for you, but because I get a higher commission on it. One guy looked me in the face, a guy I consider to be a friend. I'm a fiduciary, I'm an absolute fiduciary, I saw I was a fiduciary, but he then proceeded to sell me on a group of funds that when I did further investigation, I found out he's also a broker, and I found out that one of those funds he owns, he just has it under another company name, so you don't know it's him, and another one of those funds, he doesn't get commission, because that would be illegal, but he gets a consulting fee for the place. So All just, the loopholes. <laughs> one point, if you want to know why the financial business is so bad, 1.5% of those people are registered investment advisors and not brokers. Which is about, which is about, about 3,000 people in the entire United States. So out of 300,000 financial advisors in the U.S., 310,000, there are 30,000 that are fiduciaries, roughly. And of those 30,000, about 5,000 5, actual fiduciaries. And then of that, there's about 3,000, right? 3, oh, no, no, people. no. I'm sorry. I misspoke. There's 32,000 fiduciaries, but right. there's only 5,000 in the whole out of 300,000 that are real registered investors. And that's not enough. You could be a registered investment advisor. I have one guy... And I did a hundred plus interviews. You were one of them last, last yeah. time we did Money Master the Game and got an unbelievable response. Only two negative articles, both written by fiduciaries, <laughs> one of which managed a hundred million dollars. And his criticism was Ray Dalio doesn't know what he's talking about. Ray Dalio runs a hundred and sixty-five billion dollar firm. And he first said, What I wrote wasn't Ray. And then the second thing he wrote in the newspapers was that Ray Dalio doesn't know what he's talking about because he's changes in bonds. I mean this is the world we live in. You can have very, you can even have a fiduciary, but not very sophisticated. So now, even amongst the 5,000, you need somebody that knows how to manage things and has been through the wars and has been able to produce great results through time. And so that brings the number even smaller. But in the book, I give you the criteria yes. to test. So, you know, and if the people questions. want to see our firm, Creative Planning, they can go to getasecondopinion.com, yes. getasecondopinion.com. And if you go there, you can fill in the information and our team will evaluate it and give you a plan. If you decide to work with us, their fees are, you know, 85 basis points is their average. If you've got a lot of money, it's down to 25.25. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, it's closer to 1%. But the point is they'll do the plan for you and then you can work with us or you can go do it on your own either way. But that's our way of adding value. And I got Peter, Peter's strength, so you know, is, you know, billionaires have home offices. Yes. Usually have 10, 12 people. They don't just work on an investment portfolio. They work on your mortgage rates. They make sure your accounting and your taxes, everything is done well. Well, Peter does that now for years for millionaires, meaning doctors, lawyers, small business people. Yep. And then I convinced them to do it for people with $100,000. So, and if somebody has less than that, they'll still do it. So people can go there also as another choice, or they can just use the criteria and find their own person. So Tony, in your book, one of the other things that I loved is this book is coming out the end of the month, end of February, right? So, uh, and, and what I love about it in the book, you specifically say, hey, in 2012, the Obama administration passed the fiduciary standard for 401ks. And I was so excited because you're right, because finally, for the first time in history, not only do they have to disclose what the fees are for the 401ks, because most people don't even think there are any fees, so that's the huge issue, but more importantly, now they actually have to put your interests above their own. And I was all excited about this until last week. What happened last week, yeah. Tony? Well, uh, President Trump has decided along with his team that they want to roll back the rule before it comes <laughs> out. So, so, but by the way, the rule was already gutted. Obama yeah. had, and the Department of Labor had a really good idea. They said, look, there's $17 billion being ripped off from people every year by hidden fees. Let's make these guys have to be fiduciaries, at least on your 401k. They can yeah. screw you everywhere else still, but our trade-off will be they won't screw you on the 401k because 90 million Americans have a 401k. More Americans have a 401k than a house. Yes. 75 million Americans have a house. 
And so when I dug under it, here's what you find about the 401k industry. It's mind boggling. Six trillion with a T, six trillion dollar industry. And they did not have to tell you for 30 years, up until four years ago, they didn't have to tell you they were, what they were charging you. If you ask people today, the latest survey shows 71% of Americans think they pay nothing on their 401k. And the balance that know they're paying something don't know what they're paying, right? <laughs> so, so what industry on earth can come and just take your money without telling you what it is for decades? So four years ago, the Department of Labor changed the rules and said, you must disclose what you're charging these people. So their solution in the financial industry typical for the financial industry is come up with 35 to 50 page documents where the answers are hidden in the documents where if you have a PhD in you know economics, maybe you, you can maybe figure find it out, it. right? <laughs> but but what the, what's really amazing though today on this side is today now it looks like we're going right back to where things were before the Obama group started working on this and you're not gonna have somebody be a fiduciary. There are people in the 401k space, you can go to showmethefees.com mm -hmm. and I've got partners there in a group called America's Best 401k. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, when I worked with Jack Bogle, the first thing he said to me, Tony, was, I know you're sincere. I came for 35 minutes. I spent four hours with him, right? He goes, this has been the most probing, penetrative interview <laughs> of my entire career. He goes, I see you're sincere. I see what you care about. He goes, I want to help you. He said, you've got to work on 401ks because that's where most people are being screwed first. Yes. So I started digging under the piece in the 401k side. And what we began to find out is, if you go there, there are firms, you know, most people know. You want to make sure fees matter, so you want the lowest fees possible. Mutual funds, active mutual funds are not going to be that. Active mutual funds average 3.12%. Active mutual funds, 96% of them fail to match the market in any 10-year period of time. Only 4% do it, and the 4% are always changing, so you're not going to find them. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to happen there. Index funds, as you well know, you know, like, for example, Vanguard would be an example of that, right? The S&P 500 by Vanguard. You can get that for 0 0.05, five one hundredths of a percent. Wow. But if you go to your 401k, I can show you because people you know, go to showmethefees.com, they fill in a couple pieces of information, we show them what they're really being charged and we show them what it means over the decades because it, it compounds, right? So we save $5 million for my employees and we have the same stocks, the same <laughs> products. It's like, do you want a Honda Accord for 20,000 or 900,000? It's the same car, right? That's what they do in this industry. But what, what we really did there, we dug underneath some of these guys, most of them, if you're a small company, which is where 80% of people live and work, they don't usually have uh, on your 401k, they don't usually have the ability to put them into index funds. And the reason they say is your firm isn't big enough. What they're really saying is I can't make enough money off of you on an index fund, so I'm gonna send you a mutual funds, which all pay to play, which means they pay to be on the platform, they pay the firm, so they pay the most, they're on there, and then they charge you back all that they paid the firm and a bunch of fees so they get all their money back and then some. It's just mind boggling. You'll see Vanguard that we get 0 0.05, one of the, one firm, I won't say which one, charges 65 basis points because they do allow you to have it. So they're marking up 0 0.05 to 65 basis points, like 650%. Some charge 3% to enter the program and 2% a year. Now, if you're making 6% a year and 3% is gone in fees, how are you ever going to get to financial freedom? It's not going to happen. Yet, and yet, when the actual fiduciary standard was repealed last week, and I quote, this is a solution in, char in, in searching for a problem. This is a solution in search of a problem. And that's what the Congress is telling us. They're like, we don't need this. So the presidential scratches the order. And then everyone says, yeah, it was never a big deal anyway. Thank you, financial lobbyists. So my whole thing is I'm so glad that you put a big bright light over all of this because essentially you're one of the few people I know who break this down into very simplistic language. See, simplicity to me is the hardest thing in the world because anyone Anyone can basically send you 50 pages of gobbledygook and say, good luck and hope you can figure it out. That's what they did to hide the fees in the first place. You took the time to interview the smartest people on the planet in financials and bring it down, not to just to 620 pages, which I love then, but now it's a less than 200 pages to say, guys, this is what you need to know. If you want to know how to retire rich, you want to know what this is, this is what you do. Here's the plan. But the best part is the final part of your book, which I think is by far the most valuable to anyone who reads it, and it has nothing to do with finance. 
It's about how to be wealthy on the inside. And truthfully, yeah. if you choose to be happy and you choose, you can basically be rich the moment you make that choice to be grateful. And I yeah. love that part of it because I know people who are, they have a hundred million dollars in the bank and they're miserable and you can't feel yeah. sorry for them. <laughs> well, there's everybody's... nothing worse than an angry rich man or woman. Yeah. You want to just bitch slap them. Right? You know? Exactly. No excuses. But it's, it's the nature of the human mind. What I really want to do after writing the whole book, as I said, I'd feel remiss if I showed you how to become wealthy financial terms, uh, but I didn't show you how to truly be truly happy. And I know that sounds like yes. a big promise, but I've spent you know 40 years of my life basically studying what it is that makes people perform at the highest level. And then about 20 years ago, and then really intensely two years ago, I became obsessed with, God, I know all these people are so successful. Why are they so unhappy or frustrated or overwhelmed, they're stressed all the time. I mean, stress is the number one thing you, when you meet people, they talk about, I'm so busy, I'm so stressed, I'm so this. And so uh, about two years ago, I was, I've been studying so many different ways to help people increase the quality of their life, but I was in India with a friend of mine named Krishnaji, and he said, Tony, you know how you teach that if you have peak energy, if, you have, if you're energy rich, the world is different. You think differently, you interact differently. If you, two people are in really high levels of energy, and they're together, they're gonna have a great relationship. Two people love each other in really low energy, they're gonna say things and do things that'll mess things up in their relationship very often. So he said, you know you talk about being peak state or energy rich versus energy poor or peak state versus lousy state. He said, what if you traded those words for peak state would be beautiful state Yes. and you know, low energy state would be suffering. Yes. He said, I said, well, what's the point? He goes, I think if you made that little shift in your head, you could, notice something and he said, here's what i think you'd notice he said tony almost everybody suffers no matter how much money they have no matter how great their kids are no matter how great their spouse is and i said well suffering didn't jive with me like you know you two we're all overachievers like, like i always say you know achievers you know overachievers never get stressed you know never get fearful they just get stressed right, right? <laughs> so stress is the achiever word for fear right and similarly suffering if you told me two years ago i was suffering i'd tell you you're crazy i got the most incredible wife in the world four incredible kids and a mission and economic freedom and physical health and, and i wouldn't be lying i'd be telling you the truth right but when i made this little distinction it made me measure more and you know you can't manage something you don't measure yes and so i started measuring because i started realizing okay what's a beautiful state it's not just happy if you're happy all the time your face hurts you, know, you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta have happy or creative as a beautiful state or determined or loving or grateful i mean we can name 500 words emotions that are positive emotions that when you're in them you do what's right yes a suffering state is like frustration anger disappointment resentment fear worry concern and i had to be honest i get pissed off i get frustrated i mean yes. in fact i realized how cheap my happiness was i don't have it on oh here it is all i had to do was pick this up and my happiness would disappear like, <laughs> because you know when you've got 1200 employees on three different continents and seven different industries what are the chances that someone right now is screwing something up just right? just, just a little bit <laughs> That's awesome. upset with that many people, so many moving parts. So yeah. if your happiness requires everybody behave the way you think they should behave, treat you the way you think they should treat you, do what you think you do, it's never going to happen. So what I began to do is say, I need to draw a line in the sand and I'm going to make a decision. And, and I got this from my friend Christian G. He goes, my spiritual vision is to live every day in a beautiful state no matter what. Not so I'm positive because I'm smart. Because right. stupid people allow themselves to stay in a lousy state. Amen, brother. In a lousy state, you don't treat people better. Lousy state, it affects your health. Lousy state, you don't have a great time in your life. So it's not about being positive. It's about being smart. And so what I began to do is say, I used to try to convince myself that when I'm pissed or whatever, I get smarter. I do get stronger. But I get even stronger when I'm not pissed. You know, <laughs> and I'm playful and I can have the enjoyment of it. So I created a 90-second rule for myself. And I'm bringing this real short because I know we're running out of time. Yep. But in essence, what I did is I recognized the tension in my body when I was feeling frustrated or concerned or worried or pissed off or anything. And the minute I feel that, I give myself 90 seconds to get out of it. And it's easy to get out of it because all you have to do is change your focus. It's amazing. Even if we've all been to a funeral and everybody's crying and then somebody says something about the deceased or tells a story and you're not supposed to laugh, but it's so funny. And you go from crying to laughing your guts out, right? <laughs> that fast, just by changing what you're focusing on. So... All I did was every moment of our life, there's something to appreciate or enjoy. And awesome. when you appreciate and enjoy, stress disappears, fear disappears, all that shit disappears. So I find something right away. And what triggered me also was, again, Sir John Templeton, I asked him, what's the secret to wealth? You know, self-made billionaire, yeah. brilliant man, and an incredible giver. And he said, Tony, you all know it, you teach it. And I said, well, I teach a lot of things, which <laughs> is it? And he said, gratitude. 
Yeah. He said, how many people do you and I know that are billionaires that are miserable? And he said, how many people do you and I know? I'm sure we both know people that have almost nothing financially and they're incredibly happy, like Fiji, as you know, right? The yes. happiest people ever meet and they're anybody else to think they're in poverty. Right. And the reason is because they're grateful. They're grateful for their health. They're grateful for the weather. They're grateful for their children. They're grateful for everything. And because they're grateful, they're rich. If somebody's got $5 billion and they're pissed off all the time, their life is pissed off. So I gave myself the 90 second rule. It should have been a four hour rule in the beginning. I wasn't as good at it. Right? <laughs> but as you do it more, you get better. And now it's, I'm really good. It takes a lot to do it. And what it does is it just, there's just, it gets rid of all the drama. It gets rid of all the stresses. It puts things in perspective. You know, the whole thing, don't sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. Yes. You still are on top of things, but it's just the level of enjoyment I have. So what I want people to do is they read this book. I teach you a series of tools you can use. I take you through a closed eye process. We have an app we give you that's free that comes with this as well. And you go through the app and you do this process. And I take something that maybe you've been, maybe it's unfinished business for you in your personal life or your business life. Something that you're not dealing with because you got so much on your plate and it's just so stressful to have to deal with that stuff. And in two minutes, I have people do this with 10,000 people in a room. I teach them this technique that changes your state. And then I have them ask a couple of questions and they've got the answer. And you ask the room, 98% of the people in two minutes will have it be eliminated. Now there's lots of techniques, but I put that one in the book for people as well. My goal is, be rich right now. Feel yes. that sense of aliveness right now and build your financial freedom. You don't have to choose between the two. So, Tony, you've been incredibly generous with your time. So, Unshakable is on sale uh, now. You can actually go to unshakable.com to pre order it. And when you do, you get a special gift, right? There's a free gift yes. if you order it today. And it'll be out at the end of February. Is that right? Yeah, February 28th. February 28th. Listen, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. I always enjoy speaking with you. You are an incredible master. I, I appreciate everything you said and done. And I'm sure anybody who picks up this book is going to be thrilled. Last thing, every cent of the profit from this book goes to Feeding America. So your goal That's in the right. next eight years is to, is to feed over a billion people. And so this That's book, right. just like the last one, is, is it's, this is not about making you rich. This is about helping yeah. people find wealth in their lives, both physically and financially as well as emotionally. And all the money that comes from this book helps actually feed America, which is amazing. So thank yeah, you for I, that. Every book feeds 50 people to give you an idea. And if you decide to get more than one for your friends and so forth on our website, I have some other gifts for you. I even... If you get five books, I think we've got a piece where you get uh, my most successful program of all time, The Ultimate Edge, Amazing. at literally no charge digitally. So I'm just, I really want to get this out. I want to affect as many people as possible. And I want people to get this before the market takes a tank yes. so they can be protected and also so they can take advantage. I just want to plant one of the seed for Please. people. You got to know that the, if you're trying to time the market, you're going to be a disaster. Yes. One of the most important statistics in this book. Uh, you know, from the facts that I found has to do with the fact that if you were in the last 20 years, uh, JP Morgan and Charles Schwab both did independent studies. In the last 20 years, the S&P 500 averaged 8.2%, mm -hmm. which is really great. Mm -hmm. Compounding your money like crazy. But to give you a sense, if you miss 10 of the best trading days, in 20 years, <laughs> you think you're going to time the market. You just missed the 10 best trading days. You went from an 8.2% to, to almost half, 4.5%. If you missed 20 of the best trading days, you made 2%. If you missed 30 of the best trading days, you lost money. Amazing. And six of the 10 best trading days in history happened with, within two weeks of the worst time. So I hope when you, you'll pick up this book because what it'll do It'll teach you the patterns and it'll, it'll, it'll free you from being one of the many. It'll teach you to become the chess piece instead of the chess player. You'll be you know, one of the few versus one of the many. And it will change your life. And with your life change, you'll be able to do so much good for others. And as you said, it'll touch other people too. Amen, Bill, thanks brother. for having me on, man. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. Take care, brother. Bye. Bye-bye.